My name is Sarah from Lothian and welcome to Craftivism 101. Ooh. Craftivism is a growing worldwide movement in which acts of public craft are used to highlight political issues, to engage in activism and to encourage change in the world. Craftivists use traditional craft skills to gently provoke conversation around issues. It's a non-threatening form of activism, mostly. Combining a do-it-yourself ethic, the covert movement of street art and needlework, craftivists bomb urban spaces and inanimate objects as a means of art and consciousness raising. Sometimes political, sometimes humorous, sometimes dazzling, but always unexpected. The term craftivism was coined in 2003 by American Betsy Greer to signify the merging of two concepts, craft and activism. Today we're going to look at some historic acts of creative resistance prior to Betsy coining the term, starting with the suffragettes. People taking their protests to the street via the medium of craft has a historical precedent. At the turn of the last century, the suffragette movement demanded that women had the right to vote alongside men. They turned to applique and embroidery, raised work, collage and paint to create banners and flags to take on protest marches. This is a banner from the Women's Social and Political Union, a driving force of the suffragette movement in England, and it's adorned with the embroidered signatures of 80 suffragettes who were imprisoned and on hunger strikes. This particular banner appropriates the female social tradition by which guests would embroider their signatures for their hostess to commemorate a visit. Mary Lowndes was the founder and organiser of the Artists' Suffragette League, and she created many of the banners used in their protests. She always recommended the use of old symbols when they will serve us, but with a new twist for the new thing we're doing. This attitude still rings true of craftivists today, using and subverting old skills to create new ways of looking at issues. Suffragettes also adorned themselves with scarves, sashes, bonnets, jewellery and more that all bore their various messages. Although some of these were mass-produced, a good deal were handmade. The Women's Social and Political Union encouraged members to wear purple, white and green at all times, particularly when attending large demonstrations. Purple, green and white represented various things depending on what each suffragette group decided on, but is usually portrayed as give women votes. Women even embroidered their parasols with demands to be given the vote. In this photo, which shows suffragettes campaigning in New York in 1912, the woman on the right's parasol clearly has different sized patches stitched to the edge. As the patches are unevenly and hastily sewn on, it can be assumed that they bore slogans and demands that advance the cause she was campaigning for. Alongside political protests, the Women's Social and Political Union also ran fundraising shops staffed by volunteers. They sold propaganda literature, postcards, votes for women's newspaper, and accessories in the colours, as well as other items made or donated by suffragettes to raise funds for the Votes for Women campaign. This doll is dressed as a suffragette prisoner in rough clothing marked with arrows. Such dolls were regularly sold at bazaars held to raise funds for the militant suffragette campaign, with the added bonus of ensuring their cause was not forgotten by those who bought the products. On September 11, 1973, General Augusto Pinochet led a coup against Chile's democratically elected government. In the years that followed, almost 28,000 so-called Chilean subversives were imprisoned and tortured, and around 3,200 Chilean men were murdered or disappeared. They left behind wives, mothers, sisters and daughters who were not only beside themselves with worry and grief, but now had to find a way to support themselves and their family. During the 17-year coup, the Catholic Church provided workshops to these women to teach them useful skills such as sewing and laundry, with which they could make a wage. One of the early workshop instructors was an artist named Valentina Bonnet, who recognised these women were stricken with grief and needed a way to work through their feelings. So she encouraged them to express their emotions through small applique panels. These were called arpieras, Spanish for the burlap cloth often used for backing, and were created from scraps of fabric and, in some cases, pieces of clothing from the missing men. These objects gave voice to a population which was silenced. They told the stories of the missing men and the daily hardships the women endured, like food shortages, government brutality, unemployment and torture. They also helped the women work through their grief. Working side by side with other women, the sewing processes allowed them to tell their stories without looking at the other women. The textiles became a public telling of their stories. The cloth allows you to cry. The apieras were purchased by the Catholic Church to sell outside Chile. As international attention on Chile's political situation grew increasingly critical, the government made it illegal to own or publicly show apieras. Nonetheless, many were successfully smuggled abroad. The women had discovered a powerful way to share what was happening in their country, their neighbourhoods and their families with the rest of the world. These smuggled works allowed people outside of Chile to learn of the atrocities that were happening under Pinochet. 
Apieras were also made by women political prisoners who used them to camouflage notes sent to the world outside, to people who would denounce what was happening at national or international levels, or people who could act on their behalf. Even the most suspicious guards in the jails did not think to check the applique pictures for messages, since sewing was seen as inconsequential women's work. This apiera depicts the tragic story of Carmen Gloria Quintana and Rodrigo Rojas. The two teens were taken by a government patrol, tortured and set on fire. Carmen survived, Rodrigo did not. Carmen went to Canada as a refugee and received medical treatment. She recovered and later returned to Chile to serve as a witness against the Pinochet government. In some cases, the apieras themselves were used as part of the testimonies in front of the Amnesty International Truth Commissions and helped them build pressure to bring down Pinochet. On the 5th of September 1981, the Welsh group Women for Life on Earth arrived at Greenham Common, an RAF airbase in Berkshire, England. The group intended to challenge the decision to house 96 cruise nuclear missiles on the site and presented the base commander with a letter requesting a debate on the topic. The letter stated, amongst other things, we fear for the future of our children and for the future of the living world, which is the basis for all life. When their letter was ignored, they set up a peace camp just outside the fence. By 1982, the camp had become women only with a strong feminist emphasis and in the following months and years, thousands of women came to live and protest at the newly named Women's Peace Camp, which now consisted of nine smaller camps at various gates around the base. The women's activism came in many forms, a considerable amount of it focused on the nine mile fence that ringed the perimeter. In an interview with a New Statesman in 2007, the General Secretary for the Campaign of Nuclear Disarmament, Kate Hudson, recalls, Blocking the gates, pulling down parts of the fence, dancing on the missile silos, and creatively expressing our opposition to the missiles. In the camps between the raids on the base, women spent time making banners and weaving words, symbols, and items such as toys and children's clothing into the fence. Alongside toys and children's clothes, words, slogans, and symbols such as peace signs, doves, and rainbows were often incorporated into the chain links. A protester remembers that there were a lot of weaving things into the perimeter fence, rainbows, kid art, the whole perimeter fence was very gorgeous. There was a lot of spiderwebs in the art. Spiderwebs were a big theme. I suppose the theme of weaving something, surrounding something. Before the World Wide Web connected people across the world, women at Greenham used the metaphor of a spider's web to imagine global connections between peace activists. The webs often extended out to entangle the surrounding trees, the protesters themselves, and the workmen and machinery that were sent in to remove them. A subcontractor who had driven his bulldozer in to remove a treehouse stated in court that the girls got in front of the machine, they stood there and a couple walked around the bulldozer with woolen string going around and around with it. When the women were arrested and taken to court, some used the time to make webs there for installation back at the camp. One of the most prolific banner makers at Greenham was Talia Campbell, who started making banners to address the stereotype of the Greenham common women, which was smelly lesbians, destructive witches and a lot of silly sex-starved women with nothing better to do. Talia said, we were so vilified and I used to irritate some of the women. I said, I'd rather be vilified than ignored because at least people know something's happening. I mean, people did think we were dirty slags, lesbians, bad mothers and all this kind of stuff. Like they vilified the suffragettes in the early days. But the vilification was so untrue, I thought we had to counter it. And so that's why I started making banners really, to sort of use beauty and humour to put our point across and to tell the story. I used to go up and put them on the fence and gradually they became this great big display. In 1981, the peace camp adopted the dragon as their symbol, explaining in a 1983 photocopied invitation, the word dragon derives from a word meaning to see clearly. She is a very old and powerful life symbol. The invitation was to participate in the full moon in June dragon festival, in which women were invited to come and feast and create a rainbow dragon together. At USAF Greenham Common, on the 25th of June, a rainbow dragon will be born by joining the creative work of thousands of women, Women are making pieces of patchwork, banners and cloth paintings to join into the Rainbow Dragon for the future. Attendees were invited to dress up if you want, wear the colours of fire, make smaller dragons. Believe in yourself and know that our positive creative energy will change the world. The visitors to Greenham that day bought patches and material from home and from women who couldn't make it to the camp and helped sew together a nine mile Rainbow Dragon which then encircled the fence. Ultimately in 1991, the nuclear weapons were removed when US President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which meant the drawdown of each country's stockpile of nuclear weapons and ultimately led to the missiles being taken back to the US. The camp and the women remained for another nine years as a protest against the UK Trident program, 
which is the ongoing operation of the current generation of British nuclear weapons before leaving for the last time in 2000. On the side of one of the camps now stands a handcrafted mosaic sign commemorating the movement. So that's just a few examples of historic creative resistance. Join us next week to look at some contemporary works of craftivism around the world. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to Monster Thinks and share it with a creative resistor you know. That sentence is done, that sentence is done.